Welcome to Blue Grit Radio, the podcast that explores making better cops for a better community. I'm your host, Eric Tong. I've been an active police officer since 2007. We will dive into the aspects of police culture, health and wellness, leadership, and mindset. You'll hear from experts not only from policing, but all industries as they relate to being our best with purpose, passion, and positivity. Join me as we share stories, lessons, and advice so we can all be better for ourselves, our teams, our families, and our communities. Ladies and gents, welcome back. Uh, here's your host, Eric, and today I'm joined by Angel Ogando. Angel, how are you doing, man? Man, I'm doing so good. Excited to be on your podcast, man. I really appreciate this opportunity. I appreciate you. I appreciate you being here. And for the listeners that aren't familiar, Angel is a, a regional colleague. He is a wellness coordinator for the Auburn Police Department, just next door to me. Uh, but man, we've been talking a lot lately about how to how to elevate police wellness, right? Police wellness bleeding right into operations and their ability to take care of themselves and each other and everyone out in their in the community. But without further delay, I'd I'd love for you to share your story, how you came into work with the police and where that where that all started because it's a it's a awesome story and segue into all this. Oh, I appreciate it. And uh, again, thank you for this platform and to be able to share um, of the great opportunity that I have to serve with the Auburn Police Department. Uh, Originally, uh, about seven years ago, I started as a volunteer chaplain. Um, In my previous journey, I was a full-time minister for 20 years. And uh, during that time, I always want to give back to the community. And so I thought, what a better way to give back than to serve as a chaplain. And so I got involved uh, with the Auburn Police Department and loved it. I loved I loved the opportunity. It was uh, challenging. It was difficult. Uh, from the perspective of a chaplain, you do see a lot of a different kind of trauma, right? As families are struggling and and at times, depending on the situation, officers may struggle a little bit. It, And so during those seven years, I began to build relationships. As a chaplain, you're allowed to have access to the department. You're allowed to go into briefings. You're able to do ride-alongs. And so through those ride-alongs, you know, my eyes began to open a little bit. I began to see the city from a different perspective. And it was very fascinating um, when you're actually able to see it from that perspective. You, You do see it in a different way. And so um, fast forward seven years uh, later, uh, an opportunity opened up uh, through a grant to become the officer wellness, and they included the DEI piece altogether, uh, coordinator uh, through a grant fund, and I jumped on it. And so I was, I, was, I was so excited for that opportunity. I just felt like it was my whole life prepared me for that for that opportunity. And so I jumped in and, uh, again, like I mentioned to you, Eric, it was a grant funded position. So there was really no guarantees beyond one year and the work that we were able to produce, um, especially when it comes to, uh, building relationships and, and trust within the officers and myself in five months, we proved the concept so well that the department said, we can't, we cannot delay any longer. We need to transform that grant funded position into a full-time position within the department. And so they actually sacrificed an officer's position to give me the ability to serve the officers. And um, the program continued um, to strengthen and grow. I'm not going to take all the credit for it. I think it's the people around me including leadership, which I've talked to you about this, Eric, mm-hmm. leadership that ha- that sees the vision, sees the importance of the holistic wellness approach surrounding our officers. And with that support, within a year, the following year, um, they reclassified my title. Um, and so now my current title is wellness program designer. Mm -hmm. And so what that means for me is more ability, more access 
more authority has been given to me to produce a work, a program that will benefit officers and their families. And also we extend it to all personnel who are a part of the department. Yeah, I love that, man. And you, uh, I think you summarize it so well from our prior conversations and regional wellness coordinator or liaison meetings that we've been at together. But yeah, you, you crash course through it, but I feel like it's worth taking a moment just to go back to a few themes for the listeners. And so much of that is building trust, right? Um, I think it's fair to say, regardless of someone's beliefs or backgrounds, like to come from the ministry is meaning that you are a teacher, you're a mentor, you're a community member, you're of the community, and you put out that energy in order to make others better, right? Um, Yes. To be a leader, you need people to follow you. It's not just that you have an idea and you have something to say and you have directive, but um, that's very much a part of that. And it, it totally makes sense, especially knowing as I learn more about you to come into the chaplaincy, but shout out to the chaplains out there because, you know, we say that we are in a thankless job, but frequently people do thank us. And not to say that people don't thank chaplains, but it is very much like a behind the scenes. And I feel like it's worth highlighting oftentimes because as cops, we go to a lot of these really rough scenes and it's emotional. It's really heavy. It's uh, something that we try to almost put in a box and you know for, fortunately we can kind of hand off the box but the the work isn't done right the trauma is not done the hurt's not done and so a lot of times at least for our region it's like hey the chaplain's here to help someone or someone's through grief how to go to the next call not to say any any job is easy or harder but there's a lot that i recognized where i just really appreciate our chaplains and those in the region because i'm not maybe I'm not cut out for that. You know, maybe I'm just not best suited for that. Um, I do want to talk so much about everything we're talking about. But before I move off of chaplains, I did kind of want to get your sense, especially from your experience in the ministry and caring for people and chaplaincy. Are there any tips that have helped you or tips that you would share with others as far as how to process and metabolize a lot of that secondary tertiary trauma that we encounter as first responders? Because you see so much of it from that seat. Yes, before um, I get into that, I do want to appreciate you bringing that up as far as the work that chaplains do, uh, because um, it offers support to officers like what you just said. You know, you don't have the time. You have to investigate. You have to stay focused. And then you got to go on to the next call. So I would say that's not that you don't want to help the families out. You would love, I'm sure, to be able to do more for them, but you're in a position where you've got to continue to move forward. And so chaplains can come alongside and take that burden away from the officers and say, hey, we're teammates. We will take good care of them. And I'm I'm sure for officers, it gives a sense of peace of saying, oh, I'm so glad they're going to be they're going to be taken care of. And so that's where the chaplains do come in. And not only do we assist uh, families um, that are going through the worst days of their lives, but we, at times, depending on the context, we actually continue to move forward with them. And I personally have done several, several funerals for free to offer that support during those moments where it's just hard. Some people, they don't even know what to do. And so to be able to have the privilege to carry it through, even in moments where we do services for them beyond that evening or that call is very humbling and very rewarding. Now, as far as how do you handle that? How do you cope with all of that? Like what you said, I think a part of that is being intentional in the front end, right? In the front end, before you ever face these traumas, you want to already put in the bank so that when you face these things, you're, you're as best prepared to handle it um, because we're all going to face adversity. We're all going to get hit at some point, but surrounding yourself with people who care about you, uh, being intentional with your family, taking care of your physical self, your body, taking care of your emotional self in the front end, being proactive about those things will help you in those moments and seasons where you face difficult trauma or challenges. Yeah, I think that's so worth taking a moment to reflect on that, right? Like we can 
a lot of us really focus on what's here now in front of us. And it's easy to kind of exist mostly in this physical plane, right? And so it makes sense, hey, before I get in that that foot chase or that fight, like I recognize there are pieces that I can take care of, like exercise that will make it better after the thing than, you know, pulling a muscle or, you know, tearing a ligament because I'm not putting good nutrition in my body. Like these are things we can relate to, but I love how you essentially recognize this proactive prehab approach to our mental health because it's so much that like from being in better places and worse places through my career of my mental health. Yeah. When I had the things in practice, like the foundations, that's where I was more resilient. That's where I navigated it way better. Not to say you can't get it there, right? So that's a lot of this conversation too. And so I really appreciate you putting it in that way. Absolutely. And and yes, like you said, sometimes we learn through our mistakes and it's never too late, right? You can begin the process of um, being intentional with self-care. Self-awareness, by the way, is something that's really big. I think a lot of people, um, a lot of people don't want to, don't want to embrace the truth because they're afraid of that mm. accountability piece or they just would rather not know. But as as now that you know that um, I'm going to use a little spiritual language here, you know, it says uh, in scripture, right, the truth sets you free. Mm. So in fact, instead of running away from the truth, run towards it, embrace that truth, because that's what's going to set you free. If you really need to... It, address certain things in your life, whether it's family, whether it's mental health, whether it's physical health, whether it's financial health, whatever piece that you know you're struggling with, hit it head on, hit it head on, because though it is going to be a painful process, you know better than me, right? It is in the struggle that you grow. It is in the challenging times and those challenging seasons that when you get through it, you come out of it so much more wiser, stronger, healthier. Yeah. And I definitely would put the caveat, like, I don't know better than you. I know me, you know, and I think that we both share <laughs> in that, that insight, you know, luckily, right. And so we have the, the proper foundations and the proper experiences. And, and I think that so much of you doing what you do, you're the right person, but it's not just like a talent. I mean, sure, maybe you were a compassionate, charismatic person. I didn't know you, you know, 10, 20 more years ago. But what I do know is that you have this relationship of trust with your people, with the people at Auburn, right? And so I want to focus yes. in on that and kind of discuss, you know, I know how you got there, right? The lay listener who doesn't know you who's listening is like, okay, cool. So he, uh, you know, he was a familiar face, a chaplain. And that might be a head start for some people coming into a role like this. And luckily, we're seeing more and more roles like this popping up, whether it's sworn or yes. civilian. I love it. We need yes. more and more and more. Um, but not to say, not to take away any credit for the work you put in. So if you could talk a little bit about how you approached the role and how you made sure to really build that foundation of trust. Absolutely. I think you, uh, um, I appreciate so much this question because to me, this is the secret sauce, as we've mm. talked about before, the secret sauce to what really will give you the greatest amount of success as you're trying to serve and surround and take care of the officers and everyone within that department. It's how do you, how do you earn their trust? And so even as a chaplain, and you know this, uh, um, Eric, um, even chaplains, it, it's not automatic, right? Because you can come into a briefing and they'll, they'll, you'll be respected as a chaplain, but that doesn't mean you're in. That doesn't mean you're automatically, they're going to automatically um, open up and go deeper with you, right? And so the only way you're going to get there is you have to embrace the culture, the people in a way where when they see you, they're saying, man, this person really is, is really wanting to be a part of us, mm -hmm. right? And so I want to paint a quick picture. You're talking about not just briefings. I'm th I mean, every single training, Eric, that you have to do within your department, I've, I've been there as an observer. Mm -hmm. And I want to be clear. I never walk around and act like I am a commissioned officer. I'm very clear. 
and establish that respect that I am not a commissioned officer. You, Eric, and those of you who are officers, you signed up to step into spaces that I never have to. And if I can give you a quick example of a training that I went to that really hit me, I was there, uh, they were doing a hostage training. And um, during this hostage training, they talked about the worst case scenario where the guy, the bad guy was going to end the life of the hostage. And, and the person leading the training said, at this point, we know we got to go in. The most important person at that particular time is the hostage. Mm-hmm. And so I remember them saying, that's why we go in at that point in, in groups of three. And I think three is a, such a significant number because the three that are going into that room They say three because they go in with the anticipation that one of the three are not going to come out of there alive. Mm. And as uh, so two go in and as you know, they fan out and they're going around. If one of them was to be shot, the other officer would step over their buddy, their colleague, their friend, keep moving forward, disregard that person. And continue to focus on the most important person in that room, which mm-hmm. is the hostage. Yeah. And I want people who's, who are listening to really understand this piece. Because as you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of narratives that are being said. Some half truth, some truth, some are blatant lies. But I just want to paint this truth. And, and you need to understand that whoever that hostage is, whether they're a child, an adult, an elderly person, whether they are white, whether they're black, whether they're brown, whether they are transgendered, whether they're, you know, gender neutral or what, binary, whatever they decide as far as how they want to be perceived, it doesn't matter because what's most important is their life. And the officer going in there is is willing to sacrifice their life in order to rescue that individual. And why that hit me so hard, Eric, is because I'm, I'm, I'm in this training as though I'm one of them. And as I look around the room, I realize these are my friends. These are my colleagues. These are people that I've now spent hours upon hours and days and months with them. They're becoming like family to me. And every single person in that room, in that training, has to step into that scene except for me. Mm. Right. And so that's when it really it really hit me of, wow, what um, what a privilege it is for me to be able to have that understanding and to be in that space. And just because I've made the effort to be in that space with them in that environment, they appreciate it so much. They, they realize Angel really does care about us. Look at him. He doesn't have to be here. But why is he here? Why is he at DT class? Why is he at the range? Why is he at EVA? Why is he in training day ones? Why is he here? Why is he doing, I've done, I would say, uh, Eric, probably 90 to 95% of ride-alongs with everyone in that building. I haven't gotten everyone yet, but I think the intent and they see, and I go at times where I, I don't have to go in. I've gone in times where it's holidays or graveyard hours or times where I want to sacrifice a little bit to show them Hey, I want I want to be able to understand as best that I can as to what you do. And it's really started paying off. People started watching. People started saying, hey, Angel, when are you going to go on a ride along with me? Right. Mm-hmm. And things like that. And, and so that momentum and that spirit of just saying, hey, I'm here and I and I care and I show fruit behind that, not just in talking. But anything that you can do from making their room a little bit more pleasant, um, helping them have better uh, um, facilities so that they can actually have better um, machines to be able to have more effective things done for them. Like the little things doesn't have to be huge things. You know, there was there were some people that were like, man, Angel, I come to work and it's always ugly outside. Like no one really takes care of the property. Boom. We we it, and when I when I heard that, I was like, hey, let me see what we can do. And just communicating and being an advocate, being a voice, 
for those especially who are on the front lines, they begin to see the realness of that. Because I've said this many times, officers are trained to smell. They know BS, right? Hmm. They know when something is, is true and when someone is pretending. And I believe if you really want to earn their trust, you really got to show it. And so in time, in time, um, people started reaching out to me. People have opened up to me. The confidentiality piece is crucial. I've shown that it is safe to be able to share intimate, personal things with me. And we've dealt with all kinds of things that are so deep that you'd be surprised what, what we start talking about. But that does not happen if I'm just sitting behind a desk. For that sure. doesn't happen if I'm just in, in my office just saying, hey, I got some donuts for you. No, it happens when I'm in a ride along spending seven, eight hours, 10 hours with the individual and they start opening up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And so that is the hard work that whoever you are, whoever you represent, whatever department you have the privilege to serve, you have got to do everything you can and be intentional. Like I studied telestat. I know almost every officer's not only side that they're working, I know when they're when they're on vacation. I know mm. because it's all in there, right? It's yeah, all in the, the scheduling schedule. software. I yeah. studied I studied everyone's pictures. I'm I, I gotta make sure to know their names and and then find out about their families, how many kids they have, and all of these things begin to add up. Yeah. Is, I'll just stop there. I'll keep going, man. No, that is so good. And there's so much to take away from that, right? So, like, you know, we're talking about a civilian wellness coordinator, program designer. Um, and, you know, legit, on paper, the message or the mission is, hey, let's build a culture of wellness. Let's build programs, right? Uh, on paper, it probably doesn't say right. culture, right? Maybe maybe AC bets, you know, all that, like on his paper, but not the job description, right? It probably has to do with just, you know, supporting officers and healthy measures and these and that, those things, right? But I like how you distilled it down to like the secret sauce is just caring, right? And then showing care, right? There's a lot of people that care, but truly there, a lot of us have something to learn or something to work on in showing that we care. That's a frequent thing that I've seen at different levels or different positions I've been in where, we get so siloed by nature, right? And we get cynical because it's, you know, it's a churn and burn kind of environment. And so yes. a lot of times I like how you have this kind of open approach where you're going to build trust and you're going to build it through showing and showing up. Um, that's something that it's easy to get lost in the minutia, especially when people have different responsibilities and ancillary duties. And I'm thinking like traditional leadership. Truly, you know, I've, I've interacted with so many different agencies and through social media and like a lot of the problems are the same, right? The boss doesn't yep. care, this and that. The officers yep. don't care. They're lazy, right? They're, they only care about themselves. But then when you are in every little pocket, quickly that dissolves, right? When you spend the time to talk to somebody or have the FaceTime, you get that they have their own issues and struggles and they're trying to help the group or the team through their own means. But we lose that that connection and that cohesion unless we actually take the time and try right we all have an inbox right and so when you get the new job you probably have all these expectations so like okay what kind of programs are you going to build who are you going to bring in what instructors this and that but really your wisdom showed you that you had to build a relationship before you built programs or else what's it for uh, absolutely. And I think it comes from, again, yeah, my, my life experiences and my journey and understanding how important that is. Uh, that definitely helped me out. And I do also want to um, highlight that what, what you said about, um, you know, officers, what people may not realize, it can be a very lonely job, right? A lot of times, especially depending on what shift you're in, mm -hmm. right? When you're in the graveyard shift, then most of the people are gone. And then you're always out for the most part in your district. And so it can get very lonely, very quickly. And so um, creating a culture where, where as best you can, where the officer will still feel connected, feel like they're a part of a team, that is part of the challenge and the work that, that is necessary in order to um, 
yes, support our officers because it's, I think it's unique when you think about firefighters, right? They get, you know, no, it, you know, people smile when you think about firefighters and they, they get, they do cookouts mm-hmm. and they get all of these cool things. I've actually gone and visited some of the VRFA, um, station so that i can see so i can see from my perspective they do a great job and here's we're going to come back to hopefully firefighters uh the leadership whoever whoever sets it all up they do a great job in creating an atmosphere that creates that 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 family feeling right yeah and i believe we need to do the same for for the our police officers we need to set it up in such a way where when they come in and they just everything about the department speaks to them as saying, Hey, we care about you and you're part of the family. You're part of this team. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, you know, going off of that point, in addition to having support from the leadership, which obviously, you know, city leadership, department leadership, you wouldn't be in a position or the position wouldn't exist without that. And so that's a great first step. But beyond that, uh, what did you see or what have you experienced from the leadership, you know, for those listening that are leaders and future leaders that really helped, I suppose, solidify the foundation of you getting started? I think in the beginning, I, I don't even think they may have realized the impact of what that role was going to provide for their department. And to be honest with you, I didn't even realize the depth of what was going to happen. And so as they began listening to the stories of actual lives, like one of the things my my uh, former wellness commander who retired in, uh, in September, so I want to give a shout out to Dave Colglazer mm. who's listening. Um, he was the one through that we partnered together and, and I, I give him a lot of credit for the vision of seeing the wellness program come alive. So, um, but Dave used to tell me all the time, he said, Angel, situation after situation after situation, it is clear that if you were not here in that situation, the officer would not have reached out or gotten the help that they needed. Hmm. And so there was concrete, like real, like in real time, different scenarios. And I, Wish I could get into some of them intimately, but I can't to respect confidentiality. Yeah. But no, that, that paints the picture about, though. Yeah. I'm I'm talking about like um yes, yeah, scenarios where you, you you like family stuff, like yeah. personal stuff where things were like the opening happened where we were then able to help these individuals they got the help they needed and it was an amazing thing to watch and so they were um so excited about that reality that uh, the fruit spoke for itself Mm. yeah and that's huge i think for most people listening that are taking the time they're into self-development and team development right so that's something that i say decently frequently on this podcast but it is sometimes to underline that because the expectation and the hope is that those listeners repeat that up the chain, right? They they lead up because it's not obvious to everyone, right? Some people are like, okay, like family stuff, yeah, cool. Well, uh, yeah, we should check on them. Maybe that's like, maybe that's not the norm, uh, but you know, it certainly should be. But like, what what more can we do? And just to take a conscientious effort towards that, because hey, even if you're like, you know, just to label it like extremely antiquated, and you're like, hey, man, you're here to work, cool. But if you you do recognize that if if we don't do something to help them in that life-changing critical situation, they won't be here to work. So do you want them here to work or not, right? And so sometimes I like to remind back to, it sounds cold, but that might be how some people process things. Like, hey, even if it's just business brass tacks, cool, there is a a justifiable reason for you to care then, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, yes, for the longevity, for retention um yes all all of the above i mean 
I think I think I, I, I would like to bring this up too at this point because maybe there's people out there who listen to your program and I'm sure they're supportive, but I'm sure there are the few that are saying, what is the big deal about mm. all of this? Why, why should we even be investing in the wellness of yeah. officers? And, and so I think that's another, um, if you were to do a study and I challenge, I mean, I know um, I challenge that person to go to the department where you live in and actually step in there, ask to do a ride along, start doing the numbers and, and look at the research. You will see that what, what officers expose themselves to physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, I mean, it is one of the hardest careers you can ever do. And the numbers tell us that that is the case with how, how much, uh, Earlier in life, officers die versus the rest of the nation, as in the amounts of trauma that, um, you know, for the for the normal person, again, could be three to five. But, you know, who knows how many in a span of 20, 30 years do you actually count how much things you're exposed to? And how much evil and just the effects of the job, the mental um, toll it puts on your body, um, overexposure to things like hypervigilance. I don't think, I mean, I'm sure there's some careers that they can, you know, first, there's other first responder careers mm -hmm. where they, they, they understand that a little bit. But um, when you when you really look and dissect the impact, there's a reason why not everyone is signing up to do that job. Yeah, for sure. And I and I appreciate you taking the moment to kind of say that because originally where a lot of the social media that I got involved in like publicly as a police officer and the messaging I was trying to put out wasn't to say, hey, look at us, we're heroes. It was just to say, hey, this is where we're coming from. And I know and I see the bad stuff in the news. And believe me, no one gets more pissed off about it than cops trying to do the right thing and trying to do the best they can. And most of us... yes recognize we are far 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 from perfect right like we are we have chosen yes. to do this thing for the time we have and the time we're doing it but ultimately like if it doesn't say something um as far as hey you're right like you just said it who how many people are stepping up to do this job uh you know ask people you know ask the cop haters which i hope that some are listening because i do hope that something i'm saying makes sense like you don't have to be about us or support us but just hear where we're coming from that's that's the bridge I'm trying to create at times, but yes. do you want your kid to do this job? And I don't know. I don't know where most people land yes. on that, right? If they're, especially if they're apprehensive, even if they don't trust the police, that's okay. Like we're, we're working at it and it takes two, right? So we need both people to be a little open-minded, uh, both sides of the table. But, um, you know, you ask how many cops don't want their kids to be cops. It's a really high number, man. And so that says another thing on top of that. Yes, Eric, and I, I, and I want to be clear. I am a non-commissioned employee. Before this, I had no exposure to law enforcement. I actually grew up in the East Coast, and I actually have gone through some um, bad experiences. Mm -hmm. I had a bad experiences, and so the apprehension and the nervousness of stepping into that department. That will be another podcast, Eric. Yeah, yeah, but. But stepping into that space where I can actually see the truth and be exposed to it, I, I want to reiterate that officers, I know that the narrative, the media, and, and society we just paint this picture as these robots, mechanical robots mm -hmm. that have no emotions, that, you know, just, just want to, like, give everyone tickets and make everyone like have, have you know, suffer, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever that might be. Yeah. The truth is they're just like us. They're people like us. They enjoy basketball. They have families, they have fears, they have goals. They, they're, they're kind, they're intelligent. I want people to understand another thing that really uh, within the last year, Eric, it started to bug me, man. I've noticed now from now in my new journey, how how many uh, movies out there paint pictures as officers as being dumb, mm. you know, and, and incapable. But yet, again, understand if you're listening to me, 
if you're listening to me, the amount of decision making that these individuals have to make in real time that can be life and death and the processes and all of the things that they are that that, that is needed for them to have the competency to do the good work that they do is incredible. And on top of that, you got to understand, we got to understand that they're educated. There's people who serve with masters and doctorates and have come from different careers and backgrounds who have felt the call to want to serve the community in this new way. And, and they're brilliant. They're intelligent. And I think that's just something that, I'm just trying to humanize you, Eric, mm -hmm. and your people, because sometimes we don't realize we just see the uniform and we just see what we think we understand. But these are people who are just like the rest of us. They bleed like us. They have bad days like us, good days. They struggle. And, and, and why my, my, to circle back to why we're having this podcast I believe officers, they're willing to die for a stranger. They're willing to do all kinds of things, but it is very hard for officers to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And that is a truth that is a hard pill to swallow as well for officers. It is very hard for them to acknowledge that, man, you need it. I need to take care of myself. And I think we're changing that culture and Eric, people like you and you, you know, with your experience and, with um, your voice and saying, no, we, we got to change that. We got to do better. I appreciate that. But as you know, we're still in that culture that's shifting. And, and the more we can have officers be confident in saying, man, I can take care of myself, the better it is going to be, not only for them, but for our communities. Because at the end of the day, if you're in the community and wondering, again, what is this all about? You need to understand that the healthier, the more the officers are taken care of, the healthier and the better and the safer our communities will be. Yeah, absolutely. So just like we expect professional athletes to do everything they can to take care of themselves, go into the cold plunge, do the red light therapy, see the life coach, talk to the financial planner, make sure so that when you are going to perform on Sunday for the 12s, you're going to do your best. Mm. That's exactly how we need to view our officers, because this is not a game, by the way. For them, this is life and death. And so we want them and need them to be as mentally strong, healthy, and, and in turn, in turn, they will be able to produce a wonderful work in our community. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot I want to wind back to. And it's, you know, even for you to acknowledge that you had some not so great dealings with the police. And, you know, I, I did in not like a terrible way. But you know, I, I was terrified of my mom. So I was like a pretty straight laced kid. And I stayed out of trouble. But a few, you know, run ins like lighting off fireworks, you know, and getting, you know, getting, getting the police response and like speeding way too fast. And I remember having these, these really you know, fulfilling stereotypes, essentially, right? This, this cop just showing up and just chewing me out for like this, uh, in a, in a, ah, what word am I trying to, chewing me out for this like ridiculous amount of time. And I was terrified. Don't get me wrong. I had full respect for the law, but looking back, you know, I can empathize. I'm like, man, that's probably the last thing that he wanted to do was you know, deal with my dumb kid, butt, right. For, for creating this mess and generating this yeah, 911 yeah. call. And he had better things to do, certainly. Right. And so sometimes we do fulfill those stereotypes because of the compassion fatigue. So we do get robotic. Right. Um, and at the same time, yeah, we get critical of ourselves and each other. We eat our own. But I appreciate that you were, you know, willing to have the open mind and, and dive deep into the culture to immerse yourself. Because, you know, talking about that hostage class, right, where you can talk about priorities of life, this is something that officers first responders know like hey you you go into un unsafe situations that's kind of the point and it becomes so normalized for us but really for a lay person that hasn't heard, heard that you know methodology where hey yeah it might be a kid or an elderly person the hostage might be a hardened criminal that you might have dealt with before but it doesn't matter because that is the victim then right and victim takes number one correct. so your buddy takes a bullet 
and you keep going to neutralize the threat, save the victim, and then later you can attend to your buddy, right? And we all have that expectation. And so, you know, when you, you paint that picture and tell that story, it reminds me of being in those rooms where you have those conversations from the time I was in academy and the feeling and the atmosphere is palpable that everyone in the room is on the same page. You're like, yep, yes. send me, right? And kind of gives you chills to think about, but that is a real thing. Luckily, we haven't had the type of uh, active shooter, you know, travesties that you're seeing popping up way too frequently. But I remember I was working day shift as a sergeant a few years ago, and it came on our, our radio frequency that, you know, an unincorporated rent in, there were school security and some local, you know, school resource officers responding to a report of a subject with a gun. And immediately, okay. you know, I get in my car and no one has to say anything. It's just every, you know, you get on the call, you can do it. You can either do it on the radio or you do it on your computer, right? But then as soon as I added myself and just started going that way, man, the computer, you couldn't even read how many units were on it. Because if this is that call, if this is the day, everyone's going, right? You don't have to say it, which is fantastic. I know we've had some some yes. missteps in the nation, so it's worth talking about that. Like, no, but if you do this job, there's it's okay to be scared, but we're going to go, right? Yes. And that's the point. So I really appreciate you talking about that. Um, but yeah, who takes care of the caretakers? And that's really the theme here. Um, you know, you already gave us a little sneak peek to some of the cool things that you're building on. Um, and I do want to take some time, you know, it's because it is the secret sauce isn't the stuff. It's not the red light therapy. It's not the cold plunge. It's not the Zen room, which you guys have a legit Zen room with a massage chair and, you know, some Mario. Um, but how do you even get started? And that's what I want people to think about because every agency is different. Every culture is different. Some people, one day, hey, gold standard, you got a full-time employee. Um, other people, like you're on a committee and you're working 12-hour shifts and you're just trying to meet once a month for something. Yes. So, yeah, where do you yes. get started and how? what informs you and guides you in um, developing the programs there? I think, number one, reach out. I think when I first started, I thought I was – I couldn't – I didn't know. I didn't know there were so many people around like yourself that have already been in that journey of trying to build something. So reach out and network. Um, that's number one, because there are, there may be someone right next to you who can come alongside you and help, help you vision, help you organize, help you create ideas. Number two, I'm so thankful for the wellness grants that are out there. And so not sure if I've mentioned this, but um, the public may not realize that wellness wasn't actually taken seriously until 2017, but really didn't begin to get momentum till 2019. And then COVID hit. And so we're coming out of that. And now a lot of people are kind of just um, starting to try to get that momentum again. And so this concept of wellness, holistic wellness, is fairly new nationwide. Nationwide, this is not normal. And so with that being said, so grateful for those um, entities that offer wellness grants. Because, And so if you're listening to me, go for it. And I've actually... Um, I'm doing some of the grant writings now for some of the wellness uh, initiatives we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding that these entities, agencies or federal or at the state level, they, especially if it's focused on wellness, they want to give money. They want to give support because they're really passionate and they want to see these programs being developed um, and growing. And so I know it's a frustrating process and it can be tedious. It could be uh, a nuisance to find out when is the deadline, when you got to turn this in, when you got to, you know, turn that in, but it will be very well worth it because I believe these last two years, if it were, if it wasn't for those wellness grants, we would be in big trouble. Mm. I mean, I, I just, not that we would be in big trouble, but we would not be where we are today. Yeah we're definitely in a better spot, right? Or like it would be a peg down, yes. certainly. And we could use 18 pegs up from where we are, but we'll take what we can get and we'll keep grooving, right? Yes. 
and start small. You're not, uh, 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 I, I can say this because Sergeant James uh, from Bellevue, I kind of mm-hmm. teased about that in our last meeting. I mean, I, yeah. I saw his page and I literally was intimidated. I mean, I was like, it's a little, yeah, it's over, a lot because he's been working at it for a long time. Yeah. He's been working at it for a long time. So instead of reaching out to him, I just, I did, I should have. So if you're listening to me, if you see a department that is, seems to be doing good things, reach out to them. Mm-hmm. Don't hesitate. Cause I, I have found that sar- like people like Sergeant James, they want to help. They want to give uh, their information away because they want to see everyone thriving. Yeah. So we're, we're, we really are on the same page when it comes to wanting this to take off for everyone. Yeah. And so reach out, network, go for those grants and start small. Start small. My agenda, my first six months was to actually educate myself more. So I, I scheduled myself to go into all of these wellness and trauma uh, seminars and and whatnot and and then I focused on the ride alongs and being present mm-hmm. building relationships that was it and what happens is depending on where you're at you know your culture may be a little bit different you know our department we've we've grown and we've realized they're really big in fitness but from the perspective of um, building our gym, but some people might be from the perspective of fitness from doing a lot of hikes and things that are outside and you can adapt it to whatever that culture might be. So l- the more you build the relationships through those officers, through the personnel, you begin to actually have, have ideas and things um, like for us, for example, it was one of our fitness coaches that said, Angel, you know what would re- really be cool? And we've wanted to do it, but no one's ever gone to the next step in it was a, a-, a massage therapy program. Mm. And and I heard Lakewood was the first to do it. And man, it's not about reinventing the wheel sometimes too. Like if there's something good that your people would like to see, don't reinvent the wheel. And so I kept that thought in my back pocket and I did my research and Intel and and whatnot. And now we have a massage therapy program for the APD because of that. And so when you start small and you just focus on what's most important and just listen well, take notes, ideas will pop up. You'll, you'll see the needs of your department and you'll know which way you should go first. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well put. And uh, for one, I'm gonna have to hit you up about that massage therapy program because yeah, it's all about that. Like, <laughs> yeah, we've been, you know, I've been involved in wellness for a bit as a sergeant, but it it's not to say anyone's ahead. I mean, shout out to Sergeant Brack Bellevue, and he'll probably be a few episodes before this because uh, he came on. But yeah, he's been at it, and not to say, I mean, he's he's sharp, right? He knows his stuff, and he's yes, been he grinding. Is. But yeah, and he'll tell about how he had like 25% like actually assigned. He's like, Hey, we want you to work on your, out of your work week, roughly 25% is allotted towards wellness. Right. But he was like the field training guy and the training sergeant and then the different things, you know, kind of shifted around and now he is like full time. Right. And so again, amazing. It sounds like he hit the theme that you did, which is to justify and prove the value. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just a reminder for people to stay patient and, uh, yes. full, like full advocacy from me being like, I think my boss or one of my prior bosses was, I don't know if he was falsely incentivizing me to try to promote, but he's like, Hey, you might have so much more. It might, I should have focused on that word. You might have so much more bandwidth to work on wellness stuff. If you're in command than a sergeant. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe I'm pretty busy, you know, trying to do hiring. So you might have a point there. It has not felt that way, but I got to be patient with myself. And then, uh, but also to say, Hey, like I'm not going to be the guy forever. Certainly like none of us will. And right. So I would love, I would love some, um, some officializing of, Hey, we need to socialize and start talking about this full-time person, whatever that position looks like. Right. But ancillary duties are going to produce ancillary results. And so that's not true. No victimhood. Right. I'm, I'm going to do what I can. And for those that their their department's not a size where you can get a full time. Cool. I'm not saying like you can throw on your you know excuses hat. It's just to say, hey, you have to dedicate the time and resource. And so that could be grants, that could be partners in the community, that could be building a team where people 
take a chunk of the pie, right? So you can spread out the work, but you got to coordinate like Angel's talking about. You got to be intentional and it, it, you can't not do it. Mm. I believe Eric in, in five years, if you're not focused on a wellness program for your department, you are going to be behind the times. Mm -hmm. And that ties right in. Is, yeah. I was just going to say, I think there's a tremendous momentum of people who are so passionate, uh, uh, people who are much smarter than me, who in the world of wellness and, and educating people, um, there is a wave that's coming that is showing the importance of this work. And I think agencies are starting to acknowledge that. And so I'm excited. That makes me hopeful. That hopefully, Eric, you're, you know, every department around us, they're all, like you said, maybe not be quite full time yet, but they are very intentional in their wellness. And that's exciting. Yeah, we need it to become the norm, right? We need it to become the thing where like, oh, I'm looking at police agencies and these three have wellness, but that one doesn't. So, ooh, red flag, right? Like we need it to be a thing because truly I do also believe that if we don't make it a priority, if you are fixing your staffing crisis right now and you don't shift your your allocation towards wellness or start that up, you know, at whatever level you can afford with bandwidth and resource, then you're going to be right back where we started, right? Like, so all the people that we That's hired, correct. it'll be for not in five years, like you're saying, right? So it is investing in longevity. It's just, it's operations. Like if you don't care about the woo woo feelings, like Kumbaya, if you think that all this talk is Kumbaya or your bosses do more likely help paint the picture, like, Maybe you even take that on as like a sales point, like, hey, I'm worried about potential attrition if we don't address this. And maybe you have someone start listening up, right? No doubt about it. And, you know, we see like our, you know, most departments are all on the same journey of, of staffing issues and the departments are are all getting younger. I don't know if, I, if you know this, Eric, but for uh, Auburn Police Department, uh, they just did some numbers and it turns out that 43% of our department are personnel from zero to four years. Mm. Yeah. I don't know so, our stats. It, it probably wouldn't be that dissimilar, but our patrol is way high. Yeah. If we look at patrol, I'm sure both of ours are way higher, right? And and it's the times, right? So we can either be like, oh, man, this is this. What do we do? I mean. I mean, you just lean into it because it's not going to just change, that right? That is correct. But if we want to correct. yeah, not have this perpetually young uh, agency or organization, then, yeah, we got to take care of our people so they stick around, so they want to. And they're not just that they want to, but they are able to because it's so much of that, too. And, and at the end of the day, we want you to retire well, right? Not not continue the trend of after 30, 25, 30 years of giving up of your life for this cause, then you can expect three to five years post-retirement. Yeah. That is very sad. And I want you to understand if someone is, I know that this has been said a lot, but I don't think, I don't think Eric, most people in the community really understand that statistic. And that is very, very troublesome. That's very unacceptable if we're members of the community when the, when these individuals are putting everything on the line every day for us, we should not um, find that statistic acceptable. It's it's absolutely horrifying when you think about it. Three to five years when most of us when we retire we we can't wait to experience at least twenty, yeah. or hopefully a little bit more, mm -hmm. right? But you never thinking, oh, I only got three years. Yeah. And that is the that is the reality of what we're at. And so there's a lot at stake here. And yes, I think I think younger officers are wise enough to know now too that hey, I don't want to be that statistic. Mm -hmm. And so I know that there has been several new employees, new officers come on and it was through them finding on our website and seeing that, hey, they're gonna they're, they're going to take care of me here. That has helped, definitely has helped in their decision to want to come. Yeah, that's huge, right? And so we talk about the gold standard, but really it should be just like the standard 
Um, but we got to get, you know, we got to start somewhere. And I think that is huge, right? And like, not to belabor it, but like you said, you know, this is a conversation that's come up recently with a, you know, I just talked to uh, uh, Joe Gamaldi. He's an LT in Texas and he's, you know, highly involved with the FOP, but the same kind of conversation, right? Like, hey, how do we get you to actually get some of that pension that you work so hard for, right? The top five, you're trying to push your overtime and get your get your stuff right so that you can enjoy your life, you know, when you retire in your early to mid or late fifties even. But man, that's so young, right? And then we're gonna we're gonna croak in five to you know, five to seven or even at three years. Like that's a thing. And, you know, even the suicides that happen towards the end of a career or in retirement. And those are grossly underreported because, you know, yes. I respect, you know, privacy and, you know, everything with families, but a lot of people aren't going to outwardly say like, yeah, it was the job and, uh, you know, my, my loved one uh, suicided. Right. Um, so we know those yes. numbers are underreported and then we know chronic stress, like, Hey, even if you're you know not like rah, rah, go police, like, would you say that, a lot of stress would be hard on your heart. And most person, you know, that has no medical background would say, yeah, that, yeah, that would be a good way to exhaust your heart. It's like, well, it's happening and heart disease, heart conditions are one of the leading, you know, killers of, of cops other than ourselves. Right. And so, um, not to, not to lead into such a dark point, but that is really the crux of it, right? Like we're talking about not just survival, but to your point, like let's think optimistically, but thriving, you know, even for all, the men and women that get into their 50s and early 60s and they're retired, yeah, let's get in another 20, 30 years, right? Like not not just that they can make it, um, but where they're they're able, they're mobile, they're able to do the things, golf, play with grandkids, shoot, play with That's great right. grandkids. Like let's not just That's resign right. ourselves to this, you know, this dismal fate because that's tradition and that's historic. We got to bug yes. that trend. We got to change it. But we're, we're doing it now by literally having these conversations. By the way, the, um, the last uh, trauma and wellness conference I went to, the National Cops Conference, mm. shout out to them. They do a great job. Yeah, I need to make it to one of those. Um, Did you go to the Florida one? Go to the Florida one. Okay. They're going to go again this year, oh, I Eric. And I would recommend send a team. That's another. I mean, that is one of the best. Ones because um, there are so many resources, so many, so many good conversations that are happening. Well, the last one I went to, um, a statistic came out that officers are 25 times more likely to die from a heart attack than to be killed by a bad guy. Yeah. And the average age for the first heart attack for someone who is in law enforcement is 46 years old. So like when you were talking about issues of the heart, I mean, it, it, man, it is so hard to put into words the complexities and the dynamic of what indeed you actually are sacrificing yourself to do this job. It's, Mm -hmm. it's very, very hard to put into words. Yeah. Yeah. So for those listening, like we got to take care of ourselves. And a lot of us might be of decent health, right? Or like kind of working on, but like we got to, we got to challenge beyond that. We got to elevate our peers, right? So even if you don't have a official wellness, anything, right? It's a culture, right? So again, going way back, the secret sauce, there's no secret sauce, but there is, and it's just caring and showing up and leading, right? By example. So if you're the one that's like, Hey, um, this is my meal plan. Who's on board? Like, come on, crew. Let, let's, let's do this. Let's pack our own lunches. Let's do this thing. Or, Hey, we're going to go, hi- I'm going to go hike on this day off. And like, make, someone's going to make sure I don't go by myself. And I get, you know, I get like wounded yes. and I, you know, someone has to rescue me, um, make it fun. Right. And like work out on duty. And hopefully there's fewer and fewer policies that prevent that. I think most are just like, yeah, if you want to, but we're not going to provide the stuff. Cool. Like, right. Back in the day, like, early morning hours, me and my b- patrol buddies, we'd go to a local jungle gym and we'd crank out pull-ups. And a lot of that was to stay awake. But sometimes it was like, cause we were all commiserating cause we didn't have time to work out cause we got held late or we had court shoot, like okay. do the thing. So yeah, man. Love it. Love it. And I love what you said. Very important point before we wrap up. I'm sure we're, we're at the end there, but um, even if you don't find that you may benefit, right? But someone who is under you, someone who is under your care, especially if you're a sergeant, if you're in a position of leadership, mm-hmm. that person may 
that may be the very thing that's going to save their lives. And so I love that you mentioned that because we have to model it and we have to encourage it, even if you don't think um, there is no benefit to it. Can I say one quick story? Absolutely. On, on that? Absolutely. I, I've i never gone to a chiropractor, right? And, and I'm big on being preventative, right? We should have programs where we see physical therapists, chiropractors, or just people with those specialties in the front end. Why can't we be more preventative and proactive, right? So when it comes to chiropractor, um, I was very uh, skeptical. Mm. And so my wife had started going and they use something called like the activator. So they don't, they don't crank you, but it's like a clicking oh, yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. instrument that. that just clicks. Yeah. And she's describing this to me. I'm like, clicking? Like, what is that? Yeah. Like, are you? I was skeptical. Yeah. And she just. It sounds woo, right? Me saying, like, yeah, yes, they basically just put yes. it up to different, you know, kind of points in your body, and it it's almost like a. It sounds like a stapler. Like it doesn't staple you, right? It's just like a. It just pushes into correct. you and kind of clicks. Yeah. But it's like air pressure, right? That you don't even feel, but the pressure is still mm. doing its work. And so I was, I was almost mocking her while you're going. And she said, Angel, it's funny that you want to take care and, and have the people that you're serving be proactive. But here you are being skeptical. Mm. You're not even giving it a chance. Because you say you don't need it. Mm. And so she got me there. Right? So I said, okay, I'll go check it out. And so I went. And uh, I, I hear the clicking sounds. And she's talking to me. And, 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 I'm, and I'm thinking this is not doing anything for me. And I asked the, do- the doctor. She ends. And I say, hey, was there anything wrong with me? And I'm kind of skipping some parts, right? Sure. The doctor said, yeah, actually, your right foot was two inches shorter than your left foot and that's because your neck was off its axis by i think she said 0.6 millimeters and she said at 0.4 millimeters you can actually start to affect the brain stem and create Mm -hmm. future problems for yourself and when i actually stood up i actually it was weirdest thing eric i felt like i grew like it actually like it actually worked it actually made a difference in my life. And I didn't even realize, I didn't re- realize that I needed mm. it, right? But again, I go back to maybe you don't need that. Maybe your feet are perfectly symmetry, but you may have someone who's in your care who's off and may need that. And so the whole idea is to just be as supportive and proactive and encouraging for people to be able to take care of themselves. And if it's chiropractor, great. Physical therapy, great. If it's the wellness room, great. If you need to go outside to do some breathing, great. If you need to go to the gym, amazing. If you, by the way, we're ordering some red light panels. Yeah, I heard. So that people, if it's, if it's 15 minutes, 10 minutes to just stand next to red light so that your body can heal a little bit, great. Mm-hmm. Whatever it, it is. We just need to be more uh, intentional in supporting in supporting that vision, um, because not only will you actually benefit from it, but those around you absolutely will benefit. Yeah, from it. yeah, I love those examples, and like kind of what you're saying is reminding me of something that I'm trying to nudge some of my sergeants. Right, like I got some sergeants and some command peers that they take great care of themselves. Right. And we're allowed to work out on duty. Like our, our number one's like, hey, please do. But I'm trying to nudge them to say, hey, like I know you do your own thing and you you just stay busy at work working. But but it says something if you stop and you go in the gym yourself and your people see it's okay. You can tell them all day it's okay. And you could actually truly believe it. And you're like, hey, I'm all for it. But if they don't see you, then it doesn't signal to not just them, but the whole crew. Hey, boss is actually doing it. So he wants us to do it. Uh, so that's like, that is that's it. the challenge, right? So another shout out to yes. AC Betts and I hope he listens to this is like, when I was like touring your facility back, you know, a couple months ago, right? Like, first off, I think it's, I got to share this story when, when I was going to, you know, sit down with you, um, you know, I walked by Chief Callier's office and he's just like, what are you doing here? Right. So for the audience, they most of them know, like I came out of hiring and recruiting. I was like, I come in peace. Like I should have brought a white flag. I'm just, I'm here to talk to Angel about wellness. He's like, uh huh. But like, he just had that look on his face. Like, do I need to ask you to leave? Uh, but yeah. And then I see, uh, you know, AC bets and in the gym, he's, 
he's like Jocko style, you know, Jocko mode, right? Mm-hmm. He's just like cranked up on the, I think it was the elliptical or it was the treadmill on like high, like all the way up. I forget which one. I think one. it was the treadmill up high. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, up high, yeah, incline. Like he's just like running yes. up this constant hill, and he just like he had a vest. Hey man, and he like ve- <laughs> probably he was probably he probably had like two weighted vests or like a barbell on. I can't remember. I was so distracted by the excellence, but no, he was just like doing the thing right. So he's talking about like socializing this thing, and I was like, well, shoot, if that isn't leadership from the front or like you know, leadership, you know, through modeling, like I don't know what is right, and so. For him to be talking about what he talks about, the way he talks about it, chasing excellence, you know, having high expectations with high support. I'm like, shoot, here he is doing the thing, you know, having a great conversation, like not even out of breath. Like that's that's the thing. Right. And so what what how does that, that not it. inspire, um, you know, some motivation? So, yeah, man, you guys Absolutely. are doing a great job and I'm, I'm very I, you know, I appreciate your time. Absolutely. And just happy to help highlight that because, you know, this whole project is not to be like, look at me, look at what I'm doing, what look at what my people are doing. Like we have some areas I'm really proud of. And we have some areas to improve in and, and we all should feel that way. And that's, I think that's our Absolutely. best opportunity is elevating each other. Absolutely. And Eric, I want to say, I do appreciate your humility um, and your kindness because you have been, you're like Sergeant James. Um, you've been in the game for a long, for a lot longer and you're, you've been invested in this and, and you could have come off as uh, arrogant and like, Oh, and Oh, you guys think you're, you know, (laughs) you could have thrown shade at us, but that's not your character. And I just, I applaud, um, your character, your integrity. I, I, I hope to support you in any way that I can and I hope that, um, the work that you're doing may continue to grow because I do believe that, and, and I agree with you, your message is for the benefit of everyone. You're not just trying to um, add another star hmm. uh, for, yeah. for, no you time know, soon. Hope for not. your shelf. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm still like trying to like culture shock myself into the one I have. Um, no, but <laughs> man, thank you so much. And yeah, you are, you are providing that and you're going to continue to provide that because I'm going to keep bugging you for it. And th- that's the whole thing. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate your time, the conversation, uh, Angel, where can folks, uh, reach out or, or get in contact with you? Uh, the biggest thing, if you go on our, um, APD, Auburn Police Department webpage, call that whatever number is on there mm-hmm. and just ask for angel yeah just ask for angel i will give you a tour anyone listening to this you want a tour you want to see what we're doing i would be more than happy to show you so feel free to reach out like i said that information is on the website uh call the main number and ask for me if not uh a ogando at auburnwa.gov is my email uh feel free to email me and we'll we'll definitely um engage in a conversation and so thank you eric again for this opportunity and platform to be able to share some of the good things that we we are doing but we're doing this together definitely absolutely thanks so much man talk soon all right take care bro thank you for tuning into another episode of blue grit radio As always, support this community by subscribing, giving us a five-star review, and following, liking, and sharing posts on Blue Grit Wellness on Instagram. You can reach me there or email me at bluegritwellness at gmail.com. Be well and stay gritty.